Mary redeemed a $50,000 cash prize playing Chumba Casino this year. I was only playing for fun, so winning this was a dream come true. Chumba Casino is America's number one social casino experience. It's serious fun. With over 80 casino-style games to choose from, you too could win life-changing amounts of cash. Be like Mary. Log on to ChumbaCasino.com and give them a whirl. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void or prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The voice in the preceding commercial was not the actual voice of a winner. Hello, and welcome to the Proactive Caregiving Podcast. As a CPA with over 20 years as an industry accountant, Jessica stepped away from the corporate world to become a full-time caregiver for her mother. Having learned invaluable lessons along the way, she is now here to share those with you and to invite you to join her on this caregiver's journey. Here is your host, Jessica Cannon. Hello, everybody. I'm glad you're here with me today. I am the Proactive Caregiver, and I specialize in educating others on how to be proactive by empowering you, the caregiver. If you cannot take care of yourself, then you cannot take care of your loved one. And today I wanted to talk to you about the power of new beginnings. And that is starting over when we least expected a reboot. Because when I took the time to step away from the corporate world and started to take care of mom, I was riddled with fear there was this unknown ahead of me that made me freeze, but I had to move forward. So I convinced myself I could start a new career. And if need be, I could always step back to the old career. Stepping back was not the optimum choice, but then going forward, I had back surgery, which all I could think about was pain and pause And once again, the fear just crept into my house, to my mind, my heart. But when I finally reached a milestone in my recovery, I had what became yet another setback by experiencing a pulmonary embolism. And you guessed it, that fear not only crept into my life, but it consumed me and it almost kept me from moving forward in any kind of way. I panicked because my thought was, who is going to step in to take care of mom the way I had been doing? But by the grace of God, I didn't have to worry about answering that question because I'm here talking with you. But I did have to find the courage to be able to persevere and move forward again. But what I started to see as a setback, I started to finally change my mindset to see as a set up for what was yet to come. I had to find that power to keep going forward, that perseverance, no matter what. Self-talk can work in two ways. We can either build ourselves up with our hopes and dreams, or we can tear ourselves down. So that is why I wanted to have my next guest on today. She is the founder of the website Power of Beginning, Teresa Patino. She's going to join me because I asked her to share her powerful change in life because after suffering a chronic illness from ulcerative colitis for 22 years, you would have to wonder how giving up never became an option for her. Going from 24 pills a day to an infusion treatment every six weeks to multiple abdominal surgeries, finding peace in each new beginning became a challenge. But restoring her health became life or death priority. Each surgery led to improvements, but those improvements brought some hope that each surgery would be the last. And each surgery also reminded Teresa about the importance of what she now considers medical maintenance. Teresa needed to find happiness so that she could continue moving forward and being productive in work and for her family. She couldn't allow any negative inner talk keep her from her continued recovery. Rather than giving into despair and defeat, Teresa kept searching for the setup of each new beginning. Thanks for coming on with me today, Teresa. I'm so glad to have you with me. 
Hi, Jessica. I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited. I'm so happy to hear you're doing better and you. um, that you're back to staying busy and doing all the things that you were doing prior to your back surgery. Yes, all the things I struggled to see. How could I ever get there? Yeah, you look amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I feel amazing now. And that's all because I had to go through some of these things. And I know you know this all too well when you go through these things and have that feeling of how do I make it from here to there? Bad health or feeling down to seeing good health and being back to where you want to be. Yeah. So... You and I have been friends for a really, really long time. And you had these health, I mean, I mentioned for 22 years, you had all these health conditions. And at one point, I know you were taking care of your mom, you were taking care of your husband, your three daughters, and yourself. Yeah. How did you manage all of this? You know, so we could, I guess, touch really on the ulcerative colitis first. That controlled my life. That hit when I was around 24, and I didn't really give it the attention that it needed. I went about mm -hmm. life, had more children, family moved forward. Then um, as we were neighbors, you know, all through that time, I had been through a lot of different things. I had made the decision, actually a year prior to moving next door to you, mm -hmm. I had made the decision to have my first major surgery. Wow. And I was going through, so like you speak of all the medications, mm -hmm. the intravenous treatments, nothing was working. And basically the doc, Bella was probably four years old. Mm -hmm. um, and the doctor basically said, if we don't do something, you will eventually get colon cancer. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, how do we get rid of it? I'm ready. I, I'm too young. My children are too young. My family's too young. I have all these things and goals that I want to achieve and accomplish and so they said, we'll do a full colectomy and you'll be 100% off medications. You will have life back like you've never right. had it before. So I agree. And as you saw, I was active. We'd go walking all the time. Right. I was always, oh, the kids kept me busy driving from North Austin to South Austin all the time <laughs> for the middle child orchestra and just hustle, hustle, hustle. I loved my job. I loved my life. And then I, six years after that surgery, I had a major setback, mm. you know, and it was unexpected. I didn't know what was going on. I just know that it was one pain that started the whole downfall and change of where my life is today. And I see it was a downfall in the moment. It wasn't mm -hmm. the rest of my life, but in that moment it was because it stopped me in my tracks, didn't know where I was going, what was happening. And I ended up in a major emergency surgery. Almost, it almost took my life in front of two of my children. Mm. It was very traumatic. It was um, life changing. So went through that whole process. Another major surgery. Then I was better. And the first thought in my mind was, "So when am I going to go back to work?" And the doctors are like, "Well, I don't think <laughs> I'm gonna go." I'm like, "Let's go. Okay, let's get past this. Let's move forward." And the doctors, I don't think I really ever understood the capacity of how life-changing this was. Right. Like, everything came to a halt. Like, the doctor's like, let's just focus on today. Mm -hmm. Let's just get better. You know, and the time that we were neighbors and I lived at home, my mom did have cancer. And I was taking care of myself that way. And mm -hmm. then I was with my health. And then I just shifted to my mom. But I've never, I always tell people. My health doesn't identify me. I identify what my life is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I approach it all the time. And that's why when you talk about medical maintenance, that's exactly what my medical maintenance is. It just, it doesn't identify me today. Mm -hmm. I take care of myself and I set myself normal goals as everybody else. And even though I have to just be mindful of my health today, but with my mom and the kids, you know, I just allotted time. And I made sure I always did take that time for myself, uh, whether it was a long shower, right. whether it was being a massage, whether it was yes. just walking. Hey, you know, I love being outdoors. So mm -hmm. I would take all the walks that I took, go hiking on the trails that we had access to that were not too far from my mom. 
And then I would come back, I would be mentally refreshed, and then I would be able to step right back into my role as mom, a wife, mother, right. <laughs> caregiver, you know, a caregiver that I never saw coming because my mom was really young. She was, you know, 56 at the time. Mm, absolutely. So, See, and that's yeah. what saved me because going through the back surgery and just talking to you about it, it made me feel so much better because I didn't have that mindset. Suddenly I found myself where that back surgery that identified me instead of me identifying with my future possibilities, my capabilities, yeah. all of that. It just, for whatever reason, all that mental strength and everything I had just went away. And I was so focused on my pain and what I didn't realize was going to be a focal point for me was now my body image, one that I had finally started to accept after being able to work out and do yoga and other things that would help me with uh, pain management for the sciatic nerve. I found myself in that point where I didn't like the way my body looked after surgery. So that yeah. also messed with my mind and that body image became an issue. How did you deal with that after having surgery? You know, and I have some scars. <laughs> I have uh, all directions, little ones, big ones, you know, I have tons of them and it's all on the squares, what I call it, you know, the abdomen, right. but I don't, I guess body image, I see my scars as the track of what I've had to go through to get to where I'm at today. Nice. My husband calls them battle scars. He's like, he <laughs> loves me. Like, it doesn't matter. They're the battle scars. You know, you're here today and that's all that matters. Right. But I being feminine, you know, being a woman, mm -hmm. looking at our bodies and accepting our bodies, you know, they already change with childbirth or exactly. different things, age, hormones. And now mm -hmm. I have all these external scars on top of it. And the one thing I always tell myself is, you know what? This is my body. I owned it. I love it. It's still here today. It serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. It, you know, makes me happy. It, I still get to do my walks again. Cause you know, you will, I'm sure talk about goal setting in a little bit. Um, and, but then I do tell people, allow yourself to dislike it. Mm. You have to embrace it. You, if you need to have that private time in the shower, and cry about it, you need to do it. You have got to, yes. it's okay to be mad at what you see in the moment, but you can't allow that, you know, anger or upset or grieving because you do grieve it. I mean, I've lost organs. I have so many organs removed. It's, it's, I'm like, wow, <laughs> I didn't think you could, <laughs> but tonight I would be like, you failed me. You know what I mean? Yeah. You failed me organs, but it's okay. You failed me gut. <laughs> But it's okay, you know, and it's okay to be upset. It's okay to not be happy of the way it looks. But then we have to flip that. And then before you walk out of that shower, you better have reminded yourself that you're still here. You're beautiful. Mm -hmm. Your body is serving you a purpose. You're still being able to be mom. You're still able to be a wife. You're still yes. able to be a daughter, a sister, you know. And then I had to find, I believe in this a lot. You know what? I would get up. I didn't have anywhere to go. I could barely walk from the living room to my bedroom, mm -hmm. but I put makeup on. Yep. I comb my hair. I put nice clothes on. Whatever makes you feel good. If you like the joggers and you feel most comfortable and, and the best in that, then that's what you need to be wearing. If you feel just a little bit of lipstick or a little bit of mascara makes you feel more awake and alert, that's what you need to do. You know, you really, really need to embrace the moment. Mm -hmm. And then say, what can I apply to myself that's going to make me feel good today? And it's about you. It's not about anybody else. It's about you. Because your body is going through a change, whether it's externally, whether people can see it. I have devices on my body that nobody even has a clue that I have. Mm -hmm. Because I make sure I feel good about myself. Then you carry yourself with confidence. Yes. You're able to get out in the world, be with your friends, be with your family, things that enrich you. Um, and it's just, you know, you have to allow yourself to grieve, but then you also have to allow the happiness to be there in your life. You really Absolutely. do. And that's what you, I loved it because that's the encouragement you gave me 
when I reminding me, take those little steps, take small yep. steps, allow yourself to grieve in that moment because I didn't realize that I was grieving in that moment until I stood in front of the mirror. And it was like, my body isn't what it used to be. Um, my body maybe will not be able to do what it used to be able to do or, and that was what, it defined a moment where, that made me feel old, which I know so many women will, and I've had other friends that are a little bit older than me and they would, they would point something out in their, either their hair or their smile, their face, their makeup or something. And they would say, well, you know, you're not there yet because you're not my age. And I realized that, and I would always try and remind them, you're beautiful. It, you might be yeah. a little bit older than me, but you're beautiful. And I don't see what you're seeing, but it was right. so hard for me not to see what I was seeing in that, in that negative way. But yeah, your encouragement you know, it, helped me. Thank you. I'm so glad it did. I really am glad I was there for you because I understand the we never understand so when they say okay you're going to go into surgery now this is what we're going to do and you mentally prepare yourself mm -hmm. and you think okay when i come out i'm gonna be better it's gonna be okay i'll get through it but then you stand in front of the mirror and you're like oh my god i didn't expect this cut i didn't yes. expect it to be 12 inches i didn't expect right. it to be opened up three times i mean just different different things and everybody's different but when you it's okay to not like it in the moment right and you don't have to like it forever I had this last major surgery in June that caught me off guard six years later every six years it seems to be like it happens again and there's a part of my incision and literally an inch it's an inch but it's so different and weird how it healed hmm. that it stands out to me every time I look at it and the other part of the cut is literally eight more inches. <laughs> and the eight inches, I don't even notice, but I noticed that one inch because it's so different in the way it healed. It didn't heal right. But you know what? If you're a person and you have the means to afford it and you want to go get it fixed, go get it fixed. Do it for you. You know mm. what I mean? Like the first thing I did after the the second time I did had this surgery where I almost passed away, um, I was in the hospital for two months. Wow. And during the two months, I was under so much physical stress. My body was, I started losing my hair and I have crazy wild curly hair, right? Mm -hmm. Remember all that hair? Yes. Okay. But it's so thin now, as you can see, it's different. I have it straightened right now, but I really lost a lot of it. And the one of the things when I first got released from the hospital and I was always at the clinic, always at the doctors, constant, constant, at least two to four times a week, all the time. And the one thing I focused on, I hated my hair. I couldn't wow. stand it. I didn't like it. It wasn't the body. It wasn't the surgeries. It wasn't the pain. It wasn't that I was still walking over hunch. It was none of that. It was my hair because my hair identifies me. It oh, identifies yes. our I feel like for women, it's part of our, who we are as feminine women. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I did struggling, hardly could walk. I made that appointment. I went and I sat at my, at the person that cuts my hair and I'm like, let's fix this. Could it really start? Let's do this. Let's do that. And when I, so then the next day I saw my doctor, he's like, Oh my God, you cut your hair. You look so good because it made me feel better. Nice. So I walk with more confidence, right? You smile more. So do the little things. I mean, if exactly. it's the littlest thing, if it's, if you go have to go out and buy just something, new makeup, new something, get your nails done, do something that's going to bring joy to you because that little bit of joy will allow you to move forward to the next step, whatever that may be. And so that's kind of how I approach it. <laughs> and that's, that's how I had to start approaching it as well. Something that made me feel better. So when I had the strength to get in the shower and take care of what needed to be taken care of, then I would get out of the shower, get dressed, or I had to be helped with that. Um, then uh, I'd take the time to do my face, put my makeup on, get my hair done. And just something that made me feel like... I'm still here and I'm, I still love who I am. And that's what it was for me is loving who I am now versus who I was before all of the, the changes. Yeah. So, you know, and I'll 
tell you another little quick story. When I was in the hospital for two months and I really finally started coming to, I'm talking, it took like a good six, seven weeks before I was like, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Oh, the sun's shining. Oh, the rain's falling, you know, <laughs> but we talk about vanity. Mm -hmm. You know, some people like to twist vanity in such a negative way. Yeah. We have a right to be, everybody has vanity yes. and it's okay to have it or whatever level that you have it at. Because the first comment that came out of my mouth when I finally sat in the chair and I could feel this, I love this, the heat and the sun and it was hitting me. I got a mirror and I was like, oh wait, I have three daughters. And I was like, nobody plucked my eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> You, you think about <laughs> and funny. it sounds so simple but I was like oh my god this is y'all's duty for the rest of your life <laughs> something happens to me and I can't take care of myself it is up to y'all to make sure I have good eyebrows <laughs> so, it had nothing to do with my surgery you know what I mean right so you just oh you, know, you really don't know what targets happiness in the moment yes and you know, I feel like as women, it's always has something to do with feeling confident. Yes. And so, and it's okay to do the things that you need to do to feel confident, as long as it's not excessive and unhealthy. Right. And if you don't feel confident at the moment, it's okay not to feel confident because you're going to get there. You need to allow mm -hmm. the stages to happen and be accepting of whatever it is that you're feeling in that moment of healing. That is so true because I was reminded so many times, baby steps, baby steps, but, and I, I understood what they meant, but it, baby steps were too slow for me. I wanted it immediate. <laughs> I wanted fast, you know, I want to take adult steps. I don't want to do the baby steps. I want the leaps and bounds and I want to get to that point where I see in my mind. And that was the other thing I had to start visualizing in my mind what I wanted so that even though in the moment I wasn't there yet. I could take those baby steps because my mind was there. And so each day was easier and easier and each step was easier to take. You could probably relate to this. I think the hardest, one of the challenges was slowing down. Oh, I had yes. to learn to slow down. Mm -hmm. And that I think has been the hardest thing for me to do. Even today, even I still get reminded today, you got to slow down. Yes. This morning I had to take the time. I had to step back a little bit, take care of myself because mm -hmm. I just, I didn't wake up feeling strong. And that's probably the biggest challenge I think I have even to this day, seven years later. That's incredible. So yeah. as you continue to manage your health and do your medical maintenance, at what point did you begin to recognize that each one of these surgeries was not another setback, but an opportunity for a new beginning? <laughs> Well, I believe in the power of beginning. I really, really do. Um, because my whole life, since my very first elective colectomy, where they removed my large bowel, it, wasn't a, it was a choice. It was probably one of the hardest surgeries I've ever been through. My body acted like it was 80 years old, and mm. I went into shock on the table. Mm. I was in ICU after. I was only 38, 36, something like that, between 36, 37. And it was amazing the shock my body had. My body was didn't like it. So right there, I learned real quick to appreciate that I was still here. Mm -hmm. And then I had just finished taking, okay, then the year later, I started taking care of my mom. Right. So life, so I feel like I life has given me uh, trials <laughs> yes. that I've had to and really make me look at life very differently than the most people. So when I got sick, um, seven years ago, I was 41, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody says, Oh, your forties are the best years of your life. <laughs> you're, you know, you're like financially stable. You're, you know, you know what you want in life, your direction, things are calming down, whatever. My life's over. <laughs> I'm in my thirties. <laughs> I was 41 and everything started over. Mm. And so now that I've been through a second setback this June with mm -hmm. another big, big surgery, which is always my goal not to have, I don't do well again. And, um, but this time 
So you talk about how do you get past it and, you know, seem better. I didn't end up in ICU this time. Mm. I was out of the hospital in two weeks. Like nice. those are milestones for me. Right. And, um, you know, how do you start over again? You know, I did the exactly like when we would text, I would tell you, I literally will open the spec, the front door be like, okay, today I'm going to walk to the stop sign. That's it. Mm. That's my goal. That's it. That's simple. I accomplish it. I'm done. Yeah. I did it, sit back, relax, take care of myself, <laughs> do whatever it is that I need to do. You know, and you talk about medical maintenance, I'll mm-hmm. just be pretty open. You know, I do the um, two liters, two IV bags a day. It takes four hours of my time. Wow. Um, I don't, so it's like real obvious it's an IV, but it has a tiny little pump. It's very mm-hmm. portable. So what I do, I go, I went online to Amazon. I found a small little backpack that's mainly used for like hikers and just to carry right. some basic, right? Well, it fits perfectly in there. It's disguised. Nobody knows. And I still live life and I go do what I want to do and I need to do. That's amazing. You know? And so I just, I always say, how can I accommodate my medical side of maintenance that I need to do and incorporate it? in my life so I can still keep living. So it gets incorporated. I don't incorporate life with that. Right. right. Because if I did, I think it would be doom and gloom. (laughs) I think I would see the perspectively, I think it would be very different. And that's just not how I still go to the doctor every Monday, every Friday, like clockwork. I have not stopped going to, but here's the, the positive. Now I go twice a week when I used to go four times a week. Good. And some of those days I was there eight hours a day. I mean, I was there for a long time and lots and lots of emergency room visits. I hardly do any of those anymore. Mm-hmm. So gradually things have just gotten better as I've gotten stronger. I've had to adjust mm-hmm. my diet, just trial and error all the time. Right. You know, and, but I was, I'm a goal setter. So first was like, okay, I can't work right now. And I always said right now, everybody else said I would never. Oh, no, never, right. never. <laughs> so last year at the six point mark, I was like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can get back out there. I'm in the insurance world of employer insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I've tried every level of insurance now that I've been sick. And I, <laughs> so I really get it now. Um, and I just, I went back to work. So I told myself, okay, yes, I want to go back to work, but let's, let's be realistic. I'm not going to travel anymore like I used to. I'm still going to go into the same industry because that's where I'm good at. I work with people, relationship building. I love all that part. So now I need to find a company that's going to respect that, acknowledge and respect that I do have a condition that needs to, that comes first. Because if I don't manage the condition, I have no life. And so, and so, and they do. So I prayed about it. I applied all over town. Nothing was happening. I, I was, I say, God, you know what? Maybe this isn't where I'm supposed to go. And that's okay. I'm accepting this. That's okay. Maybe that's just not the direction. That very day I was going to take off my resume off these platforms that I had it on. I got an email literally at the moment that I was going in there to discontinue my resumes. Wow. And that's the company I work for today. They're Christian people. They're very, they put God and family first and then work. And it's like, I couldn't ask for anything more. Right. You know, faith is a really, really, really big part of my life. And I'm not talking about the, you have to be in church, traditional stuff. I'm talking about literally me and God. We just talk. We're like, okay, God, what's the plan? What's next? I'm here, you know, and it's between he and I, I carry my faith everywhere I go. I carry it with my health, you know, and all mm-hmm. the the steps I need to take because I never know what's going to happen. And I'm here only because of him. Because I when that. I was in the car, almost dying in front of my two daughters, mm-hmm. my youngest and my middle, I told God, I'm not ready. <laughs> this was like, and sometimes people think I'm so silly and crazy. I'm like, I'm not ready yet. I need to see graduations, a college graduations. Mm-hmm. I need to see marriages and I want to see grandkids from all my babies. <laughs> I'm not ready yet. And let me tell you, I'm here. Yes. 
I was in college. I have two grandbabies. Bella just graduated. Life's going, you I know. I love and I, that. And I'm just appreciative of every day. I I look for the, you know, when you so the power of beginning, like mm-hmm. we talk about beginnings, right? Focus back on that because that's what my website is called. The power of beginning is like even in the morning. I woke up. I didn't feel good. I didn't feel right. I knew something was a little off. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, today's going to be a different day. This is new. Now, how do I tackle today? Because for me, every day is different and a challenge. I have no consistency at all. And so I, what I thought I was going to do today, I'm not. I just stepped back. I did some health stuff that I needed to do, some medical stuff. I feel better. I'm here now, and I feel more right. like myself. You know, and my youngest wants to go shopping. I told her we'd go shopping today. Now I feel ready because I had yeah. to stop. The day was different and I knew it, you know, and for me, every day is truly a new start to everything. I got some big good. ones, scary ones, <laughs> and then I have some normal ones like right now. <laughs> so, you know, I'll take today over the other type. Which is helpful because... You mentioned the goal setting, and that is something that people don't realize how important that is in their lives to actually guide their lives in a certain direction so that you're living life instead of life happening to you. So you took, in just that few moments, you pretty much explained that you took that goal setting to yet another level. Instead of setting the goals for the year or what my plans are, or like that dreaded question where employers potential employers ask, where do you see yourself in five years? And you're like, I have no idea. Where would you like to see me? <laughs> Just, but you've changed it to where you have these goals that you're setting the goals daily and that you're making mm-hmm. them flexible goals so that you're not overwhelming yourself in the same time. Because I think you and I can agree and understand at this point after experiencing these kind of surgeries, uh, you are definitely more in tune to your body. And you're Mm -hmm. listening far more. And it's beautiful that you described your relationship with God the way you do. Because I feel like as the more I went through this process between the acceleration of the pain and the sciatic nerve to the actual surgery and then after surgery, I feel like I talked to God way more than I ever did before. And Isn't that amazing? It, it is. And it's that's where I started realizing these things that happen to us in our lives are not entirely setbacks. That sometimes yeah. these things have to take place. And I know your your health is a very extreme example of that, but sometimes yeah. these things take place so that we can appreciate what we do have in life and that we are able to be redirected in some cases, because that was yet another thing that until if, if my mom never reached a point so early in life that she needed the care that she did, I don't think I would have stepped away from the career corporate world at the level that I was at. And it wouldn't have redirected me. And I would have continued like you being busy with work and, and just doing, doing, doing. And I would have continued to kind of beat up my body and age it faster than it really needed to. So your short goals are nice. Yeah. You speak of that. And it's interesting because when that happened to me, so we ended up, my job had given me a promotion and moved us to college station. And uh, we were in round rock when this happened to me seven years ago on December Mm -hmm. 6th, I hit seven years and Zoe was at her best friend, my middle daughter, and Bella, my youngest, was with her. I went over there. My friend was having a baby. We did a celebration for her, and they were literally a mile and a half apart. I didn't. I started feeling bad, Mm. and I went over there, and I told Zoe, I said, we got to go. I got to go home. Something's not right, and I felt it, right, and this was before the pain. And then the pain set and everything just snowballed from there. But when I was talking to God, while I could see Bella just frozen back there in the back seat Mm. and I, and I asked it and I just felt like something came over me that it was, it was going to be okay. It's going to be rough, but it was going to be okay. And you know, the interesting part with all that time prior, Bella kept asking, mom, I wish you were a stay at home mom. I Mm. loved my career. 
And I did tend to put my career first yeah. uh, at times. And I think we all do that to a fault. It wasn't anything bad, but it just happens. Right. And uh, she kept asking, she kept asking, I wish you were a stay-at-home mom like the other moms. And I wish you were a stay-at-home mom. And it's interesting because even when that happened to me, we were living here a year and a half. And she kept asking for that need that needed to be fulfilled for her for whatever reason. Right. And it's, I would have never stopped and given her that mm. as a mom. I would have never stopped my career to give her that. And it sounds very selfish, uh, but I just think we prioritize, you know, we right. feel like if we advance in work financially, we advance in this manner, right? And then we could take care of, provide for our children in a different way. Right. And when that happened to me and I was able to be home, it gave her some of the best years and the mm -hmm. closeness that we have. And I think it's all because I was able to be home and with her every day through her school years. And I would have never done that. And so I gained a whole lot more. So I can look at the illness as a two different two ways, right? right. That it controls me, it brings me down, it stops me in my tracks and all this stuff. But how I like to see it as it gave me time with my youngest yes. that I would have probably never given her mm -hmm. uh, because we had another one in college and we were just starting college and, you know, money's just going out every direction. Mm -hmm. We have all these other priorities and it made me prioritize her. It made me prioritize um, to giving her memories that she probably would have never had. I and that. I, and I, I could never... I'm more grateful for that than exactly. anything else. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. She'll look back on that time and she'll have had positive times. It's kind of how I felt when COVID took over the world. You know, there was that uh -huh. angry kind of, why is this happening? But at the same time, I was grateful because our youngest was able to finish his senior year at home and he was yep. able to escape from certain things and that he was not excelling with at school, things that were holding him back, you know, some of the environments and some of the challenges that were there were removed and he finished school at home. And that gave us time as a family to be together because like you said, going in that different direction all the time. So it was a whole new beginning of family time together at the same time then with having the surgery that we had or that I had afterwards and then Scott taking care of me, it was, again, it was a whole new way of looking at life. And it's like, recognize these moments, having to recognize these moments that they are blessings yeah. and they give you things that you couldn't have imagined because we won't, we wouldn't have thought about them otherwise. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, these things that happen and that make us restart, we may not understand. Right why it's happening why the pods needs to to happen somebody told me this week i had, i think these are the, some of the most powerful words i've heard in a long time the power of pause yes and i feel like our surgeries uh my condition the pandemic has made a lot of people pause in their lives and reevaluate what is most important exactly and you know, uh, yeah, my health is very important. Yes, the maintenance I have to do is very important to be the best person I can be for my family. But I don't feel, I feel like my family is the most valued, you know, having my faith very strong. You know, it's just, you know, the pa I think pausing makes you realize how much value you really have in life and how much value people value you. Yes, you know, you, exactly. people forget about that. are very valued also and needed. You know, and uh, sometimes by pausing, we find our place and our stride and that we can actually really find movement. Absolutely. Uh, and so we're, we've been talking about our medical um, mm -hmm. moments, but I know there's other people that have relationships that are starting over. They're starting new jobs or relocating. Uh, maybe they've had a, a lifelong goal that they've been trying to meet and it's just not working out the way that they had anticipated. So that power mm -hmm. of pausing is yeah. a very powerful indicator that it's time to regroup. It's time to reflect. It's time to redirect. I mean, it's, it's, there's, I've had another person say something very similar to that and saying that there's the blessing and the delays. And that is something that I finally had to accept. And it really accepted. I accepted it down to that heart level that, okay, mm -hmm. 
that these Oops. delays, they're planned. Like, because sometimes these new beginnings feel like a side of that setback in life. It's just something that came out of nowhere. It came out of left field and I just didn't see it coming. But sometimes when you stop to reflect on these things, like there was a divine plan there. And it's giving you that moment to regroup so that you can strengthen in every aspect, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, so that we can be projected towards a different walk of life. Yeah. So what is one of the things that you wish others going through either similar situations as you described for yourself or otherwise, what is something that you wish they would consider as a daily wellness? I think daily wellness is, um, it looks different all the time for me in a sense. Like I think someone should really look at themselves and every day try to make something, um, a habit like repetitive, like, you know, sometimes wellness can be just taking yourself and getting in that shower. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That you know, motivation of you know, depending on what someone's going through, because it can be anything. You know, as simple as getting in that regrouping in that shower and be like, okay, it's a new start. I'm gonna come out clean and we'll wash away everything that I'm not feeling good about right now. Mm -hmm. And that could be wellness, right? Exactly. It could be that simple. It could be wellness of, I missed being outdoors. Like I missed being active, but mm -hmm. my active looks very different. I can't run anymore. When I got sick, I was training for a marathon here that oh, we have wow. in town. And that had always been one of my goals. And so that's gone. But mm -hmm. wellness to me now, I love being outside and walking and running or jogging because it would de-stress me. That was how I deal with stress. So now I do that, but I do it in a, what I do. What I do now is more of what, and what am I capable of doing today? What can I push out? Can I just do yoga? That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to stretch, relax, try to find centering, you know, or am I able to go walk two or three miles, which I enjoy the most. And sometimes I do. And sometimes I can't, uh, the weather hinders whether I can be outside or not now because of my condition. Oh, like wow. everything is affecting what my condition affects. I have to evaluate everything. But another thing could be like wellness too. You know, some people love to cook. You know, some mm -hmm. people love to give back in the means of cooking, you know, showing love through cooking. You know, that could fulfill someone's heart a lot more than they realize. Yes. It's not a chore. You know, it's not a chore. It's like, you know, I can't do much today, but you know what? If I go in there and I make this soup or I make this smoothie or I make whatever, I prep. I just cut up stuff and prep and put it away. It could make someone feel good. That could be wellness to them as being in the kitchen and having some normalcy. So you really don't. I mean, you know, you have to find what wellness is for you. You know, I try to meditate. I've tried. I don't. It doesn't. My brain's a mile a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I can't meditate. I can't. I can't do it. So, but I read. I love to read. Always have. So I try to tell myself two to three times a week, 20 minutes at nighttime before bed, try to read, open up about nothing, not learning, uh, not under about nothing, read a book that's going to either make you laugh, make you escape to a different place mm -hmm. for enjoyment, you know, because sometimes we think we're doing wellness, but we're actually doing work. Right. And wellness should be self care of some sort. Exactly. You know, I'm glad you pointed that difference out because that is something that when I first started doing my starting my self care routines, there were times that I felt a little bit more exhausted than I should have because self care yeah. should be feeding me, right? But I didn't yeah. realize what I was choosing was a type of work that was actually making me mentally focus or, and when I was done, I'd sit back and think, gosh, why am I so tired? And a lot of times I would blame that on an aging, something that I was, it, it's just, I'm getting older. It's just old age. I just have to accept this. But then I realized after the fact that I wasn't feeding myself, I was working right. and I wasn't relaxing and I wasn't um, reaching that point of a moment of gratitude. And so yeah. there is a difference. So I'm yeah. glad so you speaking of gratitude, you know, do a gratitude journal it takes you two minutes. Yes. You know, if you don't have a lot of energy, I had carry a devotional book 
in yes. my purse. I have it at my desk at my job. I can't, I don't read it every day, but you know what? Sometimes when I feel just scatterbrained, just, I can't focus. Mm -hmm. I open that up and it was a little bit of what it's just <laughs> enough. <laughs> it's just enough wellness. It refocuses me. God enriches me in some way. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. It's like, okay, this is, that's it. That's all I'm going to do today. That's it. That five minutes of reading and praying the little prayer that's in the book. And I feel so fulfilled. That is so you true. don't know what it's like, and you can't, you know, some people are very like, well, I'm looking for wellness. Well, let's dive into what works for you. What's wellness right. for you? Right. right. What works for one doesn't always work for another. I'm not a big believer in giving somebody a criteria of what wellness looks like because you don't know what it looks like for them. Exactly. And so that's, that's kind of so true. So as you continue with your recovery, you're building a whole new direction to go in and helping others and helping them understand the power of their own personal new beginning. It doesn't have to be that medical setback. It could be something that they're, they're in a place in their life that they're just not happy with and they want to go in a different direction. So how are you beginning to lay that out and set things so up? Through my them? journey, uh, these last seven years, particularly, I've been approached randomly by people and it's amazing the question that they ask that my story is so relatable to them mm -hmm. and somehow my story helps them in some way. Right. And what I found is they, all the nurses and would say, Oh, you have to go out there and look at all these forums. There's these support groups. Well, well, the one thing I found, I always say, I live in a little bit on the side of sunshine. So everything's <laughs> a little bit too positive. And then I kind of <laughs> get back down here a little bit. <laughs> And I find the good in it, right? And um, everybody was so negative. It's so doom and gloom. Yeah. Now, it's not light what I have. You know, my condition can, it, it is serious and it's very, very important. I'm not taking away from that. Right. But it doesn't have to feel like you're going to die tomorrow. You know exactly. what I mean? I major things that I'm going to have to deal with in the future. I don't worry about all that. I worry about, oh, it feels good today or, mm -hmm. you know, this weekend, I, this is what I want to do. I want to get out of town. I miss road tripping. That's what yes. be, I'm going to get that road trip going. You know, it's more, it's minor. And so along the way, I have found that people are drawn to me mm -hmm. and somehow my story helps someone else. So then I was, I had started thinking and I don't like a lot of the forums that are out there because to me, it's about positivity of what that person may need in their life at that moment right. for whatever medical or non-medical. And so I decided to share my story publicly, which I've never done. A lot of people don't realize I'm sick because I really, I think, hide it well, mm -hmm. not on purpose, but I just, that's just how it is. And I started a website and I'm starting a blog and it's called power of beginning because I feel I've had so many beginnings yes, <laughs> and I, they're not done. <laughs> <laughs> like major stuff. I'm talking about like the major big things, you know, even the power of beginning of starting my new job a year yes, ago, I yes. been there a year, December 1st, that I walked in, you want to talk about lack of confidence. I've had so much anesthesia throughout these past several years that it's affected my memory. Mm. Well, I didn't, I got the job and I was like, all right, I can do this. And then I got into my office and I shut the door and I'm like, how am I going to remember all this all the time? And you talk about that negative creeping in. It's like, yes. no, no, no. We're going to use sticky notes. We're going to write everything down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> his brain we're gonna you know all this stuff and now I'm better and I still have lax a moment that's probably a major side effect of everything I've been through is the memory loss like not short-term memory right, it's like right. I <laughs> and I just write everything down and now I feel stronger and now I feel like and that's another beginning that was another beginning mm -hmm. I had to now exercise my brain and I'm talking I do puzzles I Good. do games on uh, my phone. I do, I mean, there's just, I read. I just exercise my brain on a constant level, not just work level. And so that's what I mean, that sometimes beginnings are not just medical. And sometimes beginnings are not 
you know, something, it could be anything. It could be someone leaving a relationship and it could be somebody just needs that positive ear yes. and that hope, right? And suddenly looking for hope, like you were in a lot of pain, mm -hmm. but the hope was take that little baby step. Yeah. And remember I told you, if, it were, if you could walk from the living room to your yes. bedroom, then that's it. You're accomplished. You did something, you know, the more mm -hmm. than you did yesterday. And so the power of beginning is hopefully going to be some format of, helping others seeing their new beginning and trying to find that next step to move forward, right. whatever that may look like mm -hmm. and more of a support group, more of just to gain information, something to read. Maybe my story can help somebody that feels lost and Absolutely. trapped in the world of illness. You know, um, there is hope. There's a lot of hope out there. And, um, and so I have an Instagram account also, and it's the same thing, power of beginning. I just started this because I decided six months ago <laughs> that I was going to just, you know, get out there and just put it out there because I feel like if I'm attracting people that are gaining from my story, then there has to be others exactly. that won't speak up and that are just searching. Right. And hopefully one day I can touch those people's hearts and, and uh, we can eventually grow a community to where we support each other. I believe, um, I, I don't. I believe women should help women, and, yes. and it's really more focused on women. It'll help men too, but it's more for women because I feel when we lose our confidence in ourselves, in our bodies, in our images, a lot of things start to fall apart. Yes. And if you can, if you have a setback like mine of, of um, surgical or like yours, you know, finding that confidence back in yourself and your image mm -hmm. always helps you move forward, you know, so it, it could be as simple as beauty and it could be down to medical or, you know, I, I have a lot of information that I just kind of been holding on to. I think I'm ready to release. <laughs> yes, it's time to share. I think this is one of those moments where God touched your head and said, child, it's time for you to open your mouth and share with the world. <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> yes, exactly. So you helped me so much during that time over the summer where I was having those fighting the dark part of it. But you were reminding and you brought your little corner of sunshine into my <laughs> dark pity party of um, <laughs> what I was feeling at the moment. And I was so appreciative because it was it is very powerful. And a lot of the advice you gave me then I've continued to use, even though I'm way better than I was before and life is getting back to my new normal. Um, that advice was lasting advice that I continue to use. And I know others will be able to benefit from it. Other caregivers who are finding themselves in moments that they are feeling like they have to start over again for whatever yep. reason um, with their loved ones or just, you know, when maybe when their loved ones pass and they're at that point where they have to start all over again. So I want our listeners to be able to know of you and how to find you and reach out to you. And so, like you said, you had the website, The Power of Beginning, and you have the Instagram account, Power of the Beginning. It'll just go from there. That positivity will grow. And at, just as you mentioned, the community that is out there looking for the positive hope because I know that was another reason when I went searching for some of this type of feedback online, I seem to find people, there's uh, the other saying, uh, misery loves company. I, I yeah. don't, I don't want to fall into the pit of yeah. others who um, don't know how to get themselves out of that dark spot. I want to find people like you that help shine the light and yeah. bring people up. Yeah, because my goal is about, it's to bring motivation, little tidbits. I have everything from a port access to feeding tube experience for many years. One of my goals this past year was to get my feeding tube out. After six years, it's gone. Yay! <laughs> that's <laughs> exciting. And, you know, and that's another, like, I used to tell that it's not going to stay. And he's like, you're probably going to have it for the rest of your life. Mm, oh, wow. Now we're not. Figure this out. <laughs> no, we're <you> not. <laughs> You don't understand. And like my youngest always tells me, they said, what, what's one word that identifies your mom? Somebody asked her and they're like, she's a fixer. That's what she does. She's Aww. a fixer. So hopefully my little tidbits, my little bit of motivation <laughs> can help fix somebody's 
moment, day, improve something that may yes. be going on in their life. That's really my goal. You know, and a shout out to our husbands for being a caregiver to us, right? Yes. My husband, you know him, and he, never in a day <laughs> that I thought he could be gentle <laughs> and he has taken care of me and uh, has really stepped up through those hard moments. Absolutely. And I was stubborn along the way. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm fiery. <laughs> <laughs> and he saw it. <laughs> Well, I'm glad he was there for you, you and your family. And I'm so glad that you're doing so much better and not only doing better, but able to step into this light and help others do better too. I'm excited for you. I really, I think the future has a lot for both of us. I think Absolutely. we have a lot of good. Absolutely. So thank you for joining me today, Teresa. Uh, this has been wonderful. And I know it's going to be the first of many to come. So thank you, Jessica. You have a good day. Absolutely. Thank you and joining in with us today and listening with Teresa's triumphant story. I hope this gave you some more food for thought. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, be proactive. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We really hope you've enjoyed this episode. To learn more about proactive caregiving and to hear other episodes of this podcast, please visit www.jessicalizelcannon.com. This podcast is produced by Canon Light Media, LLC, www.canonlightmedia.com. Music provided by Chris Paradise. Mary redeemed a $50,000 cash prize playing Chumba Casino this year. I was only playing for fun, so winning this was a dream come true. Chumba Casino is America's number one social casino experience. It's serious fun. With over 80 casino-style games to choose from, you too could win life-changing amounts of cash. Be like Mary. Log on to ChumbaCasino.com and give them a whirl. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void or prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The voice in the preceding commercial was not the actual voice of a winner.